This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first session in our Autumn 2012 series. Uh, the general title for the series is Topics in International Technology Management. And this year, our focus is going to be on green technologies in transportation, especially what's happening in Asia, new developments from Asia. So I'm going to give the lead off talk today, and I have some information about subsequent talks in the series as we go along. Uh, start off with some welcome comments and about taking the course for credit if you're a Stanford student. Also, then talk about green technologies and transportation, looking at kind of from materials to systems to actual usage areas, and including the current situation in major Asian markets. Um, look at a couple of areas in which Asia has already taken the lead in terms of green transportation technologies, and uh, a little bit of information on some policies and investment plans, and finally, I think we'll have some time for discussion at the end of the session today. I look forward to your comments as well. So this is a weekly public lecture series. Public is important because it's open to everybody. We want to welcome everyone who is here, no matter whether you're a Stanford student, other member of the Stanford community, or whether you're just coming in from outside, or somehow you heard about this and so you're going to watch on YouTube. We want to welcome everybody to participate in this. It's every Thursday beginning today, except for Thanksgiving Day, through December the 6th this year. And I want to thank the Allen Miner Foundation for giving us some additional financial support of this series. This is one reason that we can put some refreshments out uh, every week at the end of the session so that we can all network out in the, the foyer out there. So each week, some guest speaker is going to be bringing in an up-to-date view about how business and technology intersects. Not purely research, not purely business, but how the two intersect in regard to an important, you know, this important area for uh, growth. Um, we try to bring in fresh content from Asia that people here might not have heard about otherwise. Um, Recent programs in this series, I'm actually rather proud that uh, it seems like everybody else in the Valley is doing mobile internet this year because we did it last year. And uh, we've looked at energy and clean tech before in 2010. We, once in a while, will do some technology strategies or uh, kind of more sort of structural changes between Asia and the rest of the world. The slides from these sessions, most of them are available on our website. So if you have an interest in any of these topics, go take a look and, and see. Uh, often our speakers have allowed us to post their slides uh, on our website. Um, I want to have a special note. Depending on how you count, this is our 20th anniversary for putting on these series. Started off in 1992 with a special series that was really taught by Professor Fumio Kodama, who at the time was one of the gurus of technology management. And um, you know, since then, the, beginning with the following year, we started to have a specific thematic uh, kind of focus for each one of the series. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've been able to scoop various things while uh, we've been doing these. Um, Back in 1995, we got Shuji Nakamura to give a presentation on his research into the blue LED before the blue laser was announced. And in fact, at dinner that night with him and a well-known professor, Jim Harris, I think I can say this now, it's 1995, we're sitting around at dinner and, and Professor Harris says, well, if you've got this and this and this kind of performance, this thing must laze. And Dr. Nakamura got real, you know, stepped back real quickly and said, don't tell anybody, we haven't announced it yet. 
So <laughs> we've been able to do that. We've been able to have some new product launches. Besides that uh, reflective LCD projector, we were the first place in the world where Sharp showed its 20-inch, back in those days, 20-inch flat panel display. Right? So we've been doing these a long time. Um, we have uh, added a, a spring series from 1995 that's kind of really currently dormant. It's morphing into a smaller series for new PhD students about how to have an impact with your research. And uh, then we've also added uh, a series on entrepreneurship in Asia that, um, from 2003. So welcome to our 20th anniversary series. It is available to Stanford students for credit. Uh, there's no prerequisites. It's open to all undergraduates and graduates. Uh, you can repeat this series for credit because the content is different each time. But remember, it is a seminar and there are limits by a lot of degree programs on how many seminars you can count toward any degree requirement. Um, we're very happy to have casual attendance by students. Um, open to the public, nobody needs to tell us in advance, um, but we're delighted to see everybody and we will have refreshments afterward. I'd like to encourage you especially to meet people that you don't already know. It's great for me to look around the auditorium and see people that I've known for years and some new faces. But if you're a student, find out who these visitors are. Get to find out why they're here and how they found out about the series and what they're really interested in. And conversely, for you folks in industry, please find out what our students are interested in. Um, I'd like to see the two communities interact more with each other. So if you are a Stanford student, please get a syllabus. This is our official agreement with you about what the requirements for credit are. Basically, there are two requirements for credit. You must be here at the auditorium for seven out of the nine sessions. Um, if you're registered through the Stanford Center for Professional Development, and uh, we get a list from SCPD about who's registered through them within a few weeks, then this requirement, of course, is waived. They, the expectation is that you're watching online. Uh, the second requirement is for everybody, students, to submit a comment or summary of each week's session for eight out of the nine sessions. Your comment is due within two weeks of today, if you're going to comment on today's session. Of course, you can take one week as an excused absence. About 60 words, just a couple of paragraphs. Please don't write a whole lot, but the pedagogical value behind this is that if you actually put something together and write something back to me uh, after having watched the session, you get a lot more about it. It really pulls the whole you know, hour and 15 minutes back into your consciousness. And if you're going to have trouble fulfilling either one of these requirements because of something happening, getting sick or whatever, please send me an email. We can usually work out some sort of a makeup assignment. All right, so um, today, one more request. Please be sure and fill out the survey that's being passed out. Uh, if you're a student registering for credit, this will be the record of your attendance today. So that's very important. Otherwise, we won't know that you're fulfilling the on-site attendance for credit. Um, and everybody else, please let us know what you're thinking. We've got some spaces on the back of the form for you to tell us what you're interested in, and we'll very much try to bend the series to the interests that you have. Um, okay, so let's talk about the greening of transportation, if my clicker will work. Okay, um, first kind of data point that I want to give to you is how the world's energy consumption has grown since between 1973 and 2009. The total final consumption, TFC, grew from 4,000 million tons of oil equivalent to 8,000 million tons of oil equivalent during that period of time. It doubled, right? Out of that amount, 
Back in 1973, fossil fuels accounted for uh, 3,500 million ton equivalent. The percentage of fossil fuels overall is less now, right? Fossil fuels accounted for 5,500 million tons of oil equivalent. But if you look at transportation, you see that almost all of the fuel used in transportation sector is fossil fuel. This is an issue because of the rapid economic growth of Asia. So total uh, fuel consumption, fossil fuel consumption grew at 57%, right? And the worldwide energy consumption grew at 78%. But transportation itself is growing as uh, more rapidly. And, um, you know, in the United States, transportation currently accounts for about 28% of all energy use. Think about China. It's still only 20% of all energy use in China. If you look region by region at this 1973 to 2009 comparison, you see how the OECD share advanced countries went down from 60% to less than 50%. And of course, the two sectors that are noticeable by their growth are China and Asia. And in this case, Asia excludes China, right? This is other Asia. Um, so total final energy consumption went from 8% to 17% um, in China and from 6% to 12% in Asia. The uh, other downside of this, though, is that regional shares of world uh, carbon dioxide emissions show an even greater increase for China and Asia. China went up from... Uh, 5.7% to 23.7% during this time period. And the rest of Asia went up from 3% to 10%, 10.9% during that time period. Now, this is, of course, a concern, right? The Asia share of total energy use has gone up by 119%, but the Asia share of carbon dioxide emissions has gone up by 315 percent. This is not a good pattern, right? Go ahead. I just wonder, what's the uh, significance of the, the year 1973? Like, why do you compare those two? Because I have good data sources for those years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing about, 19, about 2009 that's an issue is that worldwide consumption was dampened a little bit by the 2008 Lehman Brothers shock. But I'm, uh, you know, I will be honest and say that I pulled this out of a source that picked those two years. And that was the most recent data I could get on this too. Okay? Good question. Other comments? Okay. So, um, you know, by 2009, Asia, including China, the two sectors added up, account for about a third of all of the world's CO2 emissions. Now, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas, but this is certainly one of the major factors that is influencing climate change. And so, uh, you know, people are very concerned with the role of the transportation sector in creating greenhouse gas. Uh, interesting data point, in 2009, China passed the U.S. and became the world's biggest auto market. There were 170 million cars on the road in China in 2009, and they're expecting to add more than 220 million cars by uh, 2020. Um, similarly, total freight transport in China has grown by about 150% between 2000 and 2008, and I did intentionally put 2008 because the U.S. total number in 2009 was actually lower than the number in 2008. But, you know, U.S. had 7.4 percent growth in terms of ton miles or metric ton kilometers of freight traffic, um, whereas uh, in China the number is 150 percent. Needless to say, 
trucks are not nearly as clean as cars, and cars are not nearly as clean as electric vehicles. So China's very aware of this. Um, really, when we're talking about green technologies, first thing to remember is this is a relative term. Right, nothing is completely green. Uh, but it's the use of technologies, processes, or approach, approaches, say, to supply chain management that will reduce negative environmental impact or possibly improve environmental sustainability in comparison to traditional approaches. So uh, there are other terms that are very similar. You will hear these called environmental technologies, but that kind of misses the fact that you know, as a battery technology and environmental technology, maybe you don't immediately think of that. Clean tech is a term that's often used here. I tend to use the term clean tech for green technologies that make a profit. That's the way that the clean tech forum tends to describe clean tech, clean technologies, as really a, an approach to business that will be good business as well as environmentally sustainable. So we're primarily interested in kind of the technology management side here. Um, yeah, and the whole thing in transportation has really involved around reducing greenhouse gases and also reducing energy, um, which are of course related. So if you look at this in the transportation sector, this is a slide I'd like for you to think about some because you have several different levels of technology, all the way up from enabling technologies like materials and components, through the, the vehicle systems themselves, the fuels that the vehicles will use, the energy storage techniques that they use. Um, then you have the whole kind of system level that the vehicles are put inside. And uh, finally, above the systems level structure, you actually have the use of the system, how you encourage people to stop using automobiles and encourage them to switch to public transportation. Or as is the case with Stanford's Capri program, right, encouraging people to use their cars at different times of the day so as to reduce congestion on the roads. Um, so I guess the classic kind of green technology in transportation is the electric vehicle, right? But there are also electric buses, electric bicycles. Um, once in a while you see people coming up with an idea for some sort of a super light airplane. Um, improving the efficiency of vehicles has been a major step forward, even for gasoline powered vehicles, uh, using new information technology. Energy scavenging technologies that allow you to charge up the battery when you put on the brake. Um, New kinds of powertrain technologies. So one interesting difference between an electric car and a gasoline car is the electric car typically does not need a transmission. You just run the electric motor at 14,000 RPM or whatever, uh, and it's not particularly unhappy. Um, so improving efficiency. And also, in regard to vehicle technologies, we should look at emission scrubbing how people are trying to take the bad stuff out of the emissions of the cars that, not only cars, but also ships and airplanes and so forth. Uh, with fuels, this is where we also get into battery technologies and biofuels, fuel cells. Um, looking at total systems, intelligent transportation systems were all the rage here for a while, but they sort of disappeared. Uh, there's some work at Berkeley going on, but I think that m there's a lot more work going on in this sector in Asia. Um, logistics, how an airline can improve its total carbon footprint, footprint by things it does on the ground as well as things that it does in the air. And then finally, you know, the systems use function. So please consider the whole system in this quarter, we will only be able to have some representative presentations. We won't be able to cover all of this, but hopefully as we go along, we'll pick up some of the holes that we may not be able to get to. So it's not like Asia is unaware of the problem. Go ahead. I wanted to ask about 
the material covering here, specifically including the last slide. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk about greenwashing that I've heard of recently. Um, and some countries in the world would definitely disagree. I think it's the slide before this. Um, would definitely disagree with this. Uh, I think uh, Denmark has a law that will not allow anyone to say something is green if it doesn't actually uh, yield a substantial impact on the environment. It's not a reduction, it has to be positive. So it's some places in the world wouldn't call it relative. Well, okay. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm being pretty informal with the use of the word green. Uh, however, I do think that it would be really hard to draw a line what's significant versus what's not significant. Uh, I think that if you're certifying something as a green technology, that's when this becomes an issue. Right? For a survey that we're doing, we're looking at approaches that will have an impact. And, you know, uh, a reduction in energy use is an impact, right? Even if you're using the same old gasoline, if you use less of it, that should reduce your carbon footprint too. Like people, are, people are more aware of that nowadays. So. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Um, good, good comment. So getting back to this thing about Asia, uh, you know, you'll see policies in every Asia market. And I just picked three countries uh, to show. I mean, uh, China is, um, has a number of major programs. And it's interesting that they want to increase hybrid and EV autos, note carefully, not to 15% of the market, but to 15% of their domestic production. That's interesting seeing as how they haven't been making them, right? Um, so you've got that. Uh, they're doubling the long distance high speed rail that they've got, and they're significantly increasing the size of the Beijing uh, metro rail. Um, which, if you've been in traffic in Beijing, is certainly a good idea. Um, in South Korea, I was fascinated by, you know, increasing the rail share of total transport and increasing the share of bicycles as a percentage of total transport from 1.2% to 15%. Okay. I'm guessing some of those may include electric bicycles. Professor Young. Uh, exactly, oh. the electric vehicle, electric bike. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, in many places in Asia, particularly in second tier, third tier of city in China, right. the electric bike is, you know, you, you see electric bike everywhere. Yeah. And in fact, if you look at the percentage wise, one out of 10 people in China have an electric bike. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that the electric bike mostly now runs with uh, the not very green uh, lead acid battery. Yeah. Like 95, over 95% are lead acid based battery. And yeah, this is going to be one surprise. of the biggest environmental opportunities exactly. in the future is what to do with old batteries. <laughs> not only lead acid, but you know, n nickel, cadmium, and, and so forth, right? Metal hydride batteries. Uh, but that's great. So one out of 10 people in China means 130 million people or so. Uh, I remember recently seeing a big sign uh, advertisement on the street in China for a solar power charging station for your electric bicycle. So that's, yeah, this is definitely something to pay attention to. Um, Korea had probably developed more of an automobile infrastructure earlier than China has. And so I, it will be interesting to see if they can get people out of their cars and into bicycles in Korea. Uh, I wanted to throw in Malaysia, because Malaysia is one of those countries you might not immediately think of, but they're already in phase two, where they're running trials out on the streets with uh, electric vehicles. Um, and they're also very active in promoting standards for electric vehicle charging. We tend to be very passive in regard to technology standards in the U.S. And for something like charging stations or charging 
speeds and technologies for uh, electric vehicles, it really makes sense to have a world standard. Um, this is an area to watch for. So, also, I think that, you know, I'd like to mention that there are some areas in which Asia has already taken a significant lead over other areas of the world. Um, so, the very first really, truly high-speed rail was introduced commercially in Japan uh, in 1964. Now, if you go back and, and look, there were German high-speed rail technologies that go back to the 1930s. But at that point, they defined high speed as about 120 kilometers an hour. So the first Japanese train, the Series O, ran at 220 kilometers per hour. And they've pushed it up now so that their operating speed is 300 kilometers an hour, uh, and the design is rated at 330. Uh, France came in. The US has had one. Um, there are a lot of European technologies that fit in and are interoperable with the TGV. Uh, but really, kind of the next major move forward was the KTX in, in Korea. And, um, you know, it's rated at 305 kilometers per hour, right? That's the service speed. And it's, um, you know, the, the design is rated at 330. China introduced high-speed rail in 2007, and are they running them over 300 kilometers an hour now? After the traffic accident, did they cut it back to 300? Seems to me like I was on the tra I was on the train last month from Shanghai to Hangzhou, and I thought that I saw it go up to 320. But when I was looking at my source, it said 300. So if it is rated at 380, um, but they slowed it down because of the signaling problem that led to a bad accident last year. And Taiwan has a high-speed rail system that is running at 300 kilometers an hour. Got to have pictures, right? So um, the picture up at the top left, that's the Korean train, the KTX. Uh, the top right are uh, two models of more recent Japanese Shinkansen. Bottom left is the Taiwan high-speed rail, and the bottom right is uh, the Chinese high-speed rail. Uh, in fact, I took that picture in December last year. So, uh, yeah, that's in the, in the station inside Shanghai. Um, any questions so far? the extent of the network that each of these trains cover? Yeah, um, I don't have the data right with me. But, uh, you know, the, the Chinese network has been growing at just breakneck speed. It's possible to go all the way from Beijing down to southern China now using high-speed rail. And so, you know, it's been growing very fast. Most of the main islands of Japan are already connected by high-speed rail. They got a real head start, right, from 1964. And um, from Taiwan, it's, it's a line mostly from Taipei down to the south end of the island. Uh, so these are significant. These are not just small showcases. These are really heavily used. So I did hear just this week that 100% of the non-automobile passenger traffic between the city of Tokyo and the city of Nagoya goes by rail. The airlines have 0%. Um, and about 87% of the traffic between Tokyo and Osaka goes by rail. So that the airlines really have about 12 or 13%. Is it true that half the high-speed rail is in China? About half the high-speed rail? Yeah. If you're counting kilometers, probably is. Okay. I mean, you've, uh, the system in Europe is pretty big, right? But China's a very large country. And I think they have more room to expand in terms of kilometers to grow. And do you have any insight into why 300 kilometers per hour, why that limit is, is sort of been, is it self-imposed for almost 50 years? Um, 
Well, actually, the Japanese version rated at 330 is from about year 2007. Okay, and that technology was exported to Taiwan. The Taiwan train really is based on Japanese technology. China got its technology for its high-speed rail from multiple sources. And the earlier versions of the Chinese rail trains, you can tell whether it comes from a, a Japanese Shinkansen or a Siemens design or a design from uh, Bombardier, right? So they, have, they had multiple sources for their technology in China, but they're developing their own for the next generation. The uh, issue, I think, is probably as much noise for the people around the track as it is the ability of the track to carry something going that fast. Um, I think that has been, people in the railroad business have told me that that has kept a lid on the speed. So they're developing this new maglev, superconducting maglev line in Japan that will go up around 550 or 600 kilometers an hour. 89% of the thing is not just underground, but deep underground, more than 40 meters underground, which will cost them 5 trillion yen over 30 years. So, you know, $70 billion in, in today's dollars. Okay, so, yeah, pictures. Any other questions while we're here? Go ahead. Trains are more economical than airplanes in terms of energy, time, and money? Great question. And you see that I have this down here, right? Right. Uh, my understanding is that a Japanese Shinkansen takes just about the same amount of, equivalent of, of fuel equivalent per kilometer as a Boeing 747. However, the Boeing 747 will hold 400 people and the Shinkansen will hold 1,000. So if it's running close to capacity, it's very efficient. Uh, you know, I think that compared to the automobile, it's a whole lot more efficient in terms of moving people around. And the sources of energy, depending on where you're getting your energy from, you know, that's the secret behind anything electric is where you're getting your energy from. If, if you're going back to fossil fuel plants, it doesn't look as green as it did if you were not using fossil fuel, right? Okay, good questions. Go ahead. So you mentioned the Shinkansen, Siemens, and Bombardier. Yeah. Are there, are, is there, are there only those three companies that make these trains? There's like a dozen. I mean, uh, if you <laughs> look at Wikipedia for high-speed training, and you'll find like a list of 20 of these things. And you know, now there are technologies coming out of Sweden, there are technologies coming out of Spain, there are technologies coming out of all sorts of places. Uh, so yeah, these are, these are the principal service lines, okay? Yeah, Siemens makes, was making the one behind China, so they're, they're, they're a big player in this. Other questions? Okay, let's move on a little bit and talk about EVs. You may be interested to know that in 1891, there were 10 times as many electric vehicles on the road as there were gasoline-powered vehicles. And there were even electric-powered, um, you know, all sorts of interesting kind of EVs back during that period. But the real issue was that you couldn't charge them and so they were, very, they were limited to city use. You couldn't charge them outside the city. And they didn't have a range to go more than just you know, a few miles inside the city. The other thing that really kicked off the gasoline-powered car was the invention of the self-starter in 1913. Until you could have a good starter for the car, gasoline car was not going to work very well. But that fit into the sudden mass production of oil you know, it all happened kind of at the same time. And um, arguably, the oil industry has had a negative effect on the development of electric vehicles since then. Um, that's, you know, but 
who wrote the book on the, the EV1 that GM tried to produce and actually had it on the market for a year or two? Uh, rather controversial book, I remember. Um, and movie, yeah. Um, but look what happened since the late 1990s. Toyota uh, brought the Prius out in 1997. Uh, in the next year, uh, Nissan in, unveiled not only an electric vehicle, but one that used a lithium-ion battery. Back in 1997, that was really remarkable. Uh, lithium-ion batteries had a bad habit of catching fire. And so, uh, you know, the fact that they were able to do this was pretty impressive. And of course, the LEAF is now commercial. Uh, Honda has had a fuel cell hybrid vehicle uh, since 2008. You can lease the thing if you live down in Los Angeles. There are even three hydrogen fueling stations in the Los Angeles area. Toyota has a RAV4 that's a fuel cell hybrid that they're about to put out. Um, the pure electric vehicle RAV4 is going to be made in the Fremont plant down here next to the Teslas. So, uh, you know, that will make that plant very efficient. So, suddenly you see an awful lot of um, action from the Japanese car companies in the mid late 1990s with regard to electric vehicles. And Hyundai has a very big program now for developing small-scale vehicles and electric vehicles. Uh, a number of the Chinese companies are involved in this. So, um, yeah, electric vehicles is another area in which Asia has really had the lead over the U.S. for quite some time. Any comments on this slide? There are a lot of national project kind of things where people will develop a particular technology. I remember about 10 years ago, uh, the Japanese government announced a $500 million uh, fuel cell technology, not specific for vehicles, but it was a fuel cell technology national study project. And the closest thing I'd say that that's equivalent to is like a big DARPA grant program here. And uh, it typically would go to the industrial sector for research, not the academic sector, though. Other questions? OK, so some areas to, I think, or reasons why to watch Asia. I think that environmental consciousness has actually been a big part of the Japanese market for years and years and years. And it is now a huge part of Chinese government policy. Uh, so there is a, an acute awareness of the need to improve the transportation system. You're looking at uh, demonstrated R&D strengths in, in complex system design hardware and software systems, and especially some areas like robotics, I think, are very likely to be interesting the next time around uh, with, uh, with vehicles. Battery technologies are actually mostly coming from Asia now. And um, the other thing to watch is the business experience that Asian companies already have with new transportation related to technologies. So the very first Boeing 80, 787 Dreamliner went to a and And I've seen the thing at the Tokyo Haneda Airport. I haven't been able to ride on one yet, but I see it just about every time I'm there now. Um, in contrast, United takes its first 787 this month. And they made a big announcement about it on the plane last week. Um, Evergreen Line Shipping is a shipping line out of Taiwan that is devoted to green technologies in, tra in maritime transportation. So, uh, you know, they, they have been implementing a number of, I would say, more incremental innovations. Um, you're probably familiar with the commercial maglev line between the Shanghai airport and a sort of inconvenient place in the middle of Shanghai. 
Uh, it's a 32 kilometer line. The train runs up to about, oh what, 500 kilometers an hour. Takes eight minutes. So, you know, they're actually running the thing. And when you see companies that have experience actually running these things, that's really valuable. You can do an awful lot of stuff in the lab and, and develop prototypes, but when you actually take it out real time, uh, it has to have a reliability factor that's a lot more than you would tolerate in the lab. Japan Railways has developed a completely uh, paperless ticketing system. Now you will still see you know, paper tickets, but um, this ticketing system is now being used for electronic cash all around the country. That's a major step toward green. Um, other examples? I have a feeling there's a lot I could have mentioned, and there's probably people in the room who think of them. Sleeker. What are you going to say, mate? Uh, Hong Kong has the octopus card. The octopus is, card. Yeah, which is like the sleeker. Same kind of thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they've been running it. They've been for making for it work. For a long work. time, yeah. 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 Uh, we just finally got the clipper card here, right? Go ahead. I think the most uh, uh, amazing thing is the uh, electric bike. Uh, yeah. In China. Yeah, so uh, do you know who is the main maker for that? Or is it a bunch of different? Yeah, the, the, the another interesting thing is that it's all mostly, you know, small, small players. Okay, that is and, interesting. Uh, uh, the other interesting aspect is that government has a hate and a love relationship because, because it's, it causes a lot of problems to the government. Yeah. And also potential pollutions environmentally, but also on the other hand, it, it's, it's a potential a solution to reduce the emission. Yeah. One of the things to watch out for about an electric bicycle, they do great in flat places, but a lot of them don't have the power to get up a hill. And that has been a negative factor for a lot of that technology. Uh, now, I've seen some, I've seen some new, new designs that would actually deal with the hills in San Francisco. So, yeah, back in the back. I like that it's very interesting how South Korea has these marketplaces which are on the subways, so people who go back don't have to go to the market, they can do mobile shopping, so it's not only fueling. <coughs> That's actually a good point. And you're thinking about the one where you could even just take a picture with your smartphone and buy it, right? Yeah, uh, that, that really is a nice green kind of approach, and in the broad sense of if you're in the, involved in moving from point A to point B, it's very much a supporting technology. Good. So I didn't mention India in any of my slides so far, but I think that in the transportation sector, India actually has the second longest number of rail miles to China. Now this is not high speed rail, this is just total rail miles. China actually has more than just about anybody, except I think the U.S. still has more. Go ahead. I was just going to comment, kind of related to that, uh, uh, being green in the sense of not having to go somewhere, uh, which, which I think one other thing with Asia is, is, is strength in broadband and uh, some of the networking you know, stuff before you and, yeah. and cell phones. Yeah, I think the communications infrastructure, and I, maybe that should have been thrown up there in the R&D strengths, is uh, communications infrastructure. Also, uh, very well-developed wireless sensor networks. There are probably more sensors per kilometer in Japanese roads than anywhere else in the world. They will tell you in amazing amounts of information that just make you more frustrated about not getting places faster. Go ahead. I think in Japan, uh, they actually actively monitor the mobile users as they move through the traffic. They're monitoring mobile what? Mobile phones as they move through the transportation network so they can figure out how exactly to uh, manage the schedule. That's true. Now, actually, we have a commercial service here that's built very the same thing. Waze, W-A-Z-E. Is a very interesting little company where you can sign up for it and use your cell phone's GPS signal to give a real-time indication of how fast you're moving if you're commuting. And then it will 
turn out recommendations to other ways users about what roads to take. So uh, yeah, and I do think that is um, maybe in parallel the same kind of project is going on in Japan. So what's in it for the US? I think that we do need to learn from Asia examples. Um, you know, what would a high-speed rail system really look like in the Northeast Corridor? And I was talking with a railway expert earlier this week, and he pointed out that the whole approach to safety in the US has been crash worthiness, so that the people who are in a crash are basically protected. Whereas the whole situation in Japan has been crash avoidance. You know, there has been no fatal accident on the Shinkansen since 1964. There just haven't been accidents. Um, and so I think looking at the Asia examples would be really interesting. I am very concerned that we need to be a little bit more proactive in looking at technology standards. Uh, I'm aware of a major Japanese government slash industry effort to put together charging standards for electric vehicles. And they're going around and trying to sell it here, and I have a feeling that the companies here are just sort of not really paying attention. Um, global market opportunities also involve business, tech, business or technology partners, not just selling in those markets, and certainly it involves looking at global competition. What is going to happen to the foreign automakers in China as China builds up its domestic EV production? I think that's a matter that if you're connected to the auto industry, you need to be concerned about. And yeah, it's not too early to look to the next generation of cool things, things that are really early on the horizon. The maglev is probably a really good example uh, using airships, lighter than airships for freight transport across the Pacific, taking advantage of the jet stream is one of the crazier ideas that I've heard recently. Um, so there are all kinds of things like this. So what we've got coming up in the series, next week, uh, Mr. Onodera, who is the Silicon Valley representative for the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, is going to talk about Japanese government policies and investments in, in green transportation technology. They're running a number of very large smart grid projects, including one in New Mexico as well as one in Malaga, Spain, in which they're looking at combining electric vehicles in the grid for additional power storage. One of their projects is also in uh, Toyota City, which is not too surprising. Um, two weeks from today, uh, a professor from a Japanese university who is also the CEO of a company called SimDrive is coming in. And SimDrive has not just a new electric motor, but it's an in-wheel electric motor. So potentially, you could even convert old gasoline-powered cars to a car with an in-wheel electric motor. We'll see. Professor Zhang is coming from Tsinghua University to talk about some research that they've just done on uh, intelligent transportation in Beijing. In November 1, uh, Mr. Kondo, the Boeing 787 makes extensive use of carbon fiber composite materials. It's very strong and very light, and it's probably saving something like 25 or 30 percent of the energy use of the airplane. So he's coming in to talk about this, not only for airplane applications, but for how you might be able to put that into automobiles. Uh, in subsequent sessions, I'm working with a uh, company coming from China to talk about scrubbing emissions from uh, marine transport. Uh, I'm talking with um, a couple of airlines about seeing if we can get somebody to come in and talk about this whole system, this total system. We're looking at a number of other different kind of areas. Um, but that's where we are at, as we stop right now. 
I'm very happy to take your questions and discuss what your ideas and interests are in this regard. Thanks for your attention. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Two quick points. In the digital version of today's New York Times, there's an article about bicycle helmets. Yeah. And the fact that they are a significant inhibitor to follow on your point about in America, we avoid, uh, we, we try to protect individual crash yeah. and survivability and so forth. But in Paris and London and a number of other major cities around the world, they are actively omit, uh, failing to uh, encourage or enforce helmet rules. Really? My wife won't ride a bicycle probably because the helmet messes up her hair, but that's another matter. <laughs> Um, she's not here. So. <laughs> uh, but so this helmet thing, there are clearly some people. Uh, there's, a, there's the head of uh, bicycle transportation in Portland or Seattle mm -hmm. is actively uh, trying to move away from the helmet requirement, and they're getting spe uh, in a number of these cities. They're getting spectacular increases in the number of people willing to play. So that's kind of interesting on the personal behavior level. Yeah, it is. I wonder if there's any kind of solution to making it more safe without a helmet. Okay, helmet. <laughs> yeah. I actually just saw an article uh, maybe a month ago. It was basically a hood that wrapped around kind of your neck, uh -huh. and then it had accelerometers that would cause it to basically it would wait around. Basically, you. deploy basically, the airbag yeah. around your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Great new technology. The accelerometer will tell what you're going to do. It's to look a lot more socially acceptable. Personally, I think it makes a lot more sense to wear a helmet because you don't look like you're wearing this crazy thing around your neck. But yeah. I guess you're never really doing it. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Good student project. Um, yeah, just continuing with the bike helmet thing. Yeah, it's been a point in London for a number of years because David Cameron was photographed not wearing a bike helmet a couple of years ago now to try and promote this whole idea. And also there's been a study conducted that says that drivers give you more space if you're not wearing a helmet, because they presume that if you are wearing a helmet then you know what you're doing more, so they give you less space, so it's actually safer. Because they, yeah. So it's not like it's a bit debatable, but they uh, what you're doing. research into that. A couple of comments. You go first, okay? Uh, so, yeah, I want to play off that. There's, uh, there are several studies done in the United States on um, school buses. And the conclusion was that if they allowed the, the, the young children on the buses to wear seatbelts, um, the bus drivers would be less cautious. So in the United States, uh, school buses, at least as of like five or six years ago, don't have seatbelts because it causes the driver to be more careful. And it's, it's like legally enforced that way. So, <laughs> okay, back in the back. Is the uh, California high-speed rail going to make it? <laughs> so we're, okay, actually, uh, we, we co-produced a program a couple of days ago. We, we co-produced a program a couple of days ago about uh, kind of high-speed rail and investing for the future and so on and so forth. And JR Central that runs the Shinkansen between Tokyo and Osaka has invested in several projects, none of which are in California. And the, the projects are in the Northeast Corridor. And there's also, they're also investing in a project in Texas between Dallas and Houston. Uh, but I think that I'm trying to put together, I, I don't have all my speakers lined up, I'm trying to put together a panel session about what California should learn from Asian high-speed rail to be the closing session of this series. So if I'm successful with that, we'll have much better answers. Uh, Northeast Corridor, well, how come they don't have a high-speed rail for all these years? All well, years. what they have is this all Excella. The they have this Excella that actually can run about 240 kilometers an hour. So what, what's that? About 120 miles an hour, or actually, I guess, 150. Um, I think part of the issue is the whole question of 
who's going to invest in the infrastructure? Who's going to invest in the track? Accela, the passenger trains in the U.S. are tenants. They do not own the track. They're tenants. They do not own the track. The freight companies own the track. And Amtrak is a tenant. They pay a use fee, right, for using the rails. So that has meant that the government has been less willing to put in major bucks into building track beds, especially elevated track beds or you know underground track that would really make high-speed rail a lot more efficient. Uh, I think that's been part of the difficulty is the public-private division of labor. Could you enlighten us as to the personal rapid transports? I'm thinking about kind of like cars, but you know, when you go on this highway, if you want to go to long distance, maybe like there's a cable that tethers out and then you don't talk yeah, about Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. And I think that that's a great futuristic thing. In between here and there is probably the autonomous driving car where you could have four or five people in the car, but as soon as you get out onto the freeway, the car takes over and you're no longer driving. Now, honestly, there are two main things that work against that. One is people's obstinacy for liking to drive. Okay, I mean, there's just any kind of a new technology that requires a major behavior change is dicey. Until you actually deploy it, you never know whether people are going to like it or not. So who's going to spend the money to deploy it? Uh, the second thing is legal liability. If there are private companies involved, they will be very concerned about what kind of liability protection they have in case something in the system goes wrong and somebody gets killed. Uh, in the U.S. especially, that's a, a real negative factor for real sort of different ways of moving people around. Transportation system, and I understand that you will have a, a China. But uh, mm -hmm. um, do you um, the explain about you know that the U.S. and Japan? The reason is um, I investigated uh, um, about year you know, 2000, 2001 about ITC for U.S. and the uh, Japan market, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously it didn't happen. They focus on the 2010, and, uh, and I want to know how things are going. Not only the U.S. but uh, uh, these Asian countries. Especially also uh, the um, uh, U.S. because uh, Google is uh, you know developing the uh, remote control car. So will you touch? Yeah. Okay. So intelligent transportation systems are kind of a specific domain of technology, kind of like artificial intelligence is a specific domain of technology. Like artificial intelligence, it disappeared and it's come back before anybody even noticed. So the the top-down plans for developing intelligent transportation systems sort of didn't really have the demand side that would make it immediately implementable as business. So it got to the government project level. There were a bunch of different government projects. There are still some going on here in the U.S. as well as in other places. But what has happened is everybody carrying around a mobile phone, right, and the kind of informal intelligent transportation systems networks. So I got into a taxi in um, Tokyo. No, it was in Fukuoka. It wasn't even in Tokyo last week. And on the display, which usually has a GPS, it shows where every taxi in the fleet is. There are two at the station. There are three by the airport. There are two, to, you know. And that's a pretty intelligent transportation system, right? So it's come back without people noticing, just like AI has come back as advanced analytics. I get people disagreeing with me on that. Go ahead. Ed. Richard, you had the battery expert from Tesla at the right. seminar. And what we learned from his presentation is that they made the decision to use laptop batteries, lithium-ion batteries, uh, because their availability and cost, presumably. And they put in parallel something like 6,000 of them. Yeah. Um, has that battery technology gotten more specific to EVs? Because that, that seems to me to be... Actually, it's not exactly like a laptop. The form factor is. But the content, the energy delivery, is different from a, a standard AA battery that you buy. 
It looks a lot like a AA battery, and you're right. There in, there's about 6,800 of them in the pack. And um, they did that because it was a cheaper solution to get them in a pack like that. It was also a more safe solution because if one of the batteries goes bad, you can isolate it instead of having the whole pack blow up, right? Um, and so I think that uh, there is a lot of work on batteries for vehicles. That's a, certainly a major area that all of the car companies are looking at. And the lithium ion technologies have improved a lot. Be a battery company as opposed to a car company. The car was just an advertising mechanism for their battery technology. So have the have the um, Europeans and the Japanese and Chinese rushed to license that? Do you know? Not yet, really. Uh, I think that the kind of battery provision is in the Toyota Rav4, since that's coming out of the same line as the Tesla cars. Okay. Go ahead. Some info I wanted to throw at that. Um, I worked for SpaceX for quite some time, oh. um, and they actually use, I guess, licensed maybe could be the word, uh, a lot of better technology from Tesla. I mean, the CEOs are the same. So yeah, I, right. Elon you know, Musk is the there, there, there was. But, yeah. <laughs> at least one company does use their stuff. Uh, to follow on the the same uh, theme, um, I think Nissan. Uh, has their own like R and D department for battery technology. So, uh... well, the division of labor is really hard because Nissan has their own R and D division like that. There are Japanese companies like Denso and Ebiden that supply the car companies, kind of like Visteon supplies Ford. And the real question, from the standpoint of management, is who controls the specs. It has gotten to the point where the parent company, the Toyota, tends to control the specs and force its supplier companies out of really interesting research, even though they've got a lot of the knowledge in the company. And so if the supplier company, and I'm thinking of a relationship like between Robert Bosch Corporation and the Japanese, uh, the German car makers, right, BMW and, and Benz and, and also Volkswagen, where Bosch is pushing ahead new technologies and then they're able to get one of the car companies to buy it. That would be a more productive situation in Japan. Go ahead. Uh, does car sharing play a role at all in Asia? Not nearly as much as you would expect. I mean, I, I'm looking around. Does anybody know if... if, if Zipcar has tried to go anywhere in Asia? No, uh, but it's cheaper to hire a driver than to buy a second car. <laughs> so a lot of people do that and split it. Yeah, okay. Life. <laughs> what I do think is going to happen is you're going to have inside the major cities a lot more restrictions on having cars at all. And that is probably going to not only push, you know, mass transit, but it would also push car sharing for the limited number of vehicles allowed inside the city on the city streets. So I think it's not as far along as it is here, but I would say that it's likely to grow rather quickly. Other questions or comments? Uh, do you think the shale gas revolutionary? Uh, shale, shale gas? gas yeah. Uh, in the U.S. The Canadians uh, do. Yeah, in France, oh. uh, <laughs> we take technology in the U.S. Well, okay, I think that um, to the extent that shale oil will be used to make gas, which is used in transportation, this fits into the overall topic. Uh, it's a major source, and it is economic in Canada. There's a lot of concern up in Canada about um, the environmental side of that. Uh, I was just in Ottawa two weeks ago looking at new research proposals about this kind of area. And I think that the shale oil is an interesting stopgap. Uh, they've also just announced uh, they're, they're taking it out of the ground in, in Japan now, in Akita. Yeah. And so uh, this is, you know, hot and it's a new source and I think it's Japan's first domestic source of oil. Um, 
but whether it will really be economical or whether it might even be a distraction, it's kind of hard to tell. I, I think that moving away from fossil fuels and toward renewables is going to be the dominant path for general energy. Now, in transportation, you've got to get your energy from somewhere else, which means that uh, you know, the internal combustion engine, you're producing the energy in the car instead of just using stored energy from whatever source, right? Yeah. In improving uh, urban traffic and yeah. reducing emissions, and in Kuala Lumpur, they, they put in, I mean, it's really yeah. sort of thing. They, it was hard to walk from like point A to point B, even though it's really, really short. Because you'd get killed or no, hit just, by a car? Just like it's not designed for like okay. people to walk. Yeah. It's very hot, humid, and, yeah. and um, I guess I just heard this week all the taxis on strike because they put in this new system to put people to walk and free buses and yeah, it's really cheap to get taxis. Yeah, yeah. So looking around, Malaysia had a very well described plan that you know I quoted in, in that slide. And it is definitely kind of a top-down, we will do this <laughs> sort of approach. Um, who knows? <laughs> yeah, one more, and then let's all go out and we can continue our discussion over, uh, over refreshments. Two more. Go ahead. Um, from the list of speakers I see here, I see that the definition of Asia by this class is mostly East <laughs> I uh, so. <laughs> looked around really hard for India, okay? And Mahindra has a very interesting EV uh, program that they're working on. The basic transportation infrastructure in India is kind of a disaster. And so, uh, you know, that, that, that's not moving ahead. Public sector stuff doesn't move ahead nearly as well as private sector things do in India. Uh, I looked around. We may not be able to have them come. So, yeah, out of curiosity, um, so the follow-up, so like Thailand, Laos, mm -hmm. those, those yeah. guys are like so low on the so low on the transportation scheme. They're, they're not really low on the transportation scheme. The the things uh, Bangkok is a really interesting place in terms of looking at the transportation system and what can be done about it. It's also a very big automobile market. Um, I wasn't able to find anything that I thought would be like really unusual, you know, something that's sort of looking far enough ahead that would be really different. Uh, go ahead. I don't know where the refreshments are going to be served, but for the last two weeks, I have been the proud owner of one of the fastest electric bicycles in the United States of America. It's custom made locally. And if anyone would like to see it, I probably can't give many people uh, give you a chance to uh, play with the accelerator. But uh, it is an interesting example of the high end of powered, small scale, two wheeled machine. How, how, how many? How fast will it go? Thirty miles an hour. Wow. <laughs> and it will climb hills. I climbed up the hills. Okay. The okay. Hills. Uh, how many CCs? Uh, it's electric. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no cylinders. Not found a motor. Is anybody here from the, the I understand there's a, a company incubating in Stardex here at Stanford that has kind of like a power-assisted skateboard that's got an in-wheel oh, yeah. electric motor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, aside from the kind of safety angle of that, I think it's fascinating, <laughs> fascinating information. Let's go out and have some refreshments and keep talking. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.